This is the Skeptic Squared Podcast. A safe place to make light of sacred things. My name is Matt. And I'm Corinne. And in this program, we will be discussing current events related to religion, atheism, and skepticism. Our goal is not to insult believers, although that will probably happen from time to time, but rather to share our point of view on these topics in a way which will benefit and entertain others. Or maybe we just want to stroke our own egos. You decide. Welcome to the Skeptic Squared podcast. That was Corinne joining me in the hello. It was actually very together. It was very well timed. <laughs> um, today is Monday, uh, December 14th, 2015. And uh, just real quick, we'll just get our contact info out of the way so we can get to the, the podcasts. Um, we have our, e- our email is skeptic squared podcast at gmail.com. And our uh, website is www.skepticsquaredpodcast.blogspot.com. Um, and remember, you can uh, leave a review or rate us on iTunes. Um, today, we have a, a special kind of uh, first time thing that we're going to do. Maybe this will be a thing that we do more often. But we watched a movie mm-hmm. yesterday, it was a Christian movie one of those propaganda films that you can find on Netflix or any number of places. And uh, we watched a movie that caught our eye because one of the people on the the poster was none other than Kevin Sorbo. Mm -hmm. Now, Corinne, who is Kevin Sorbo? Hercules. (laughs) Hercules. (laughs) (laughs) Apparently he's an actor, does lots of Christian movies now. Right, it seems to be kind of his, his new thing. So he, yeah. he was... He's he was God is not dead. Right, so he started out doing more uh, like TV show type stuff and kind of got a name for his role as Hercules. And uh, he apparently has been doing shows like the one that... or movies like the one we reviewed. Um, and last year, was it? There was the big movie that came out, God's Not Dead. I think it was just the beginning of this year. Was it this year? I think so. So I went to Netflix really quick. Year, okay, I I remember it being last year. Anyway, it was. Uh, and they're making a sequel to God's Not Dead, God's Not Dead Two, mm-hmm. um, which we're super excited for mm-hmm. because we watched the Sabrina first one. Sabrina the Teenage Witch is in it. I know, <laughs> although I don't think Kevin Sorbo is going to make a comeback, even though um, Christianity is all about people coming back from the dead. <laughs> <laughs> so. I, I don't know if we just gave a spoiler in the first one, but <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. So we watched the the first God's Not Dead, and so now we have an eye for Kevin Sorbo movies, <laughs> <laughs> or at least that's the way it seems. Uh, we had a, a few other movies on our list that uh, we might we may get to. We have a Ray Comfort movie, um, Audacity, mm-hmm. that we might do a review on. His anti-gay rights movie or anti-gay um, marriage. That's the one, right? It's like right after the Supreme Court ruling, he mm-hmm. came out with this movie. Mm-hmm. And then there was a Kirk Cameron movie that we almost did, Unstoppable. I'm not entirely sure what that one's about. It seems like it's an anti-evolution uh, yeah. All propaganda I remember film. remember is that clip that we watched where with, with the dirt. Spears and the dirt. Yeah, the, the, that was a spoof of yeah. it, but, but yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, so the movie that we did end up watching with Kevin Sorbo um, was Confessions of a Prodigal Son. Mm-hmm. So Prodigal Son is a story, it comes from the New Testament, and uh, it's, it's a pretty well-known story. It, it, uh, it, you know, you have the two sons, one of them is more frivolous with his money. Um, I, I guess we can go through the story. It's the... The story is in Luke 15, verses 11 through 32. And I actually looked it up and read it today uh, to be prepared for this. Um, Yeah, I know. Me doing some research and homework. I did nothing. (laughs) Uh, So basically, this is one of three stories that Jesus uses in response to the Pharisees who accuse him uh, of hanging out with sinners and prostitutes. 
So the Pharisees see hang, Jesus hanging out with these people, these low lowlifes, and they st start saying nasty things about him. And Jesus responds to them with a couple of parables, uh, one of which is also a very famous one. You know, if, if a shepherd loses one of his hundred sheep, he, goes, he leaves the, the, the 99, 99 and then goes finds the one and brings it back. And then the other one was something about a woman um, losing one of her ten coins and she sweeps the house out, finds uh -huh. the coin, and then tells all of her neighbors and everybody's happy for her. Um, and then the prodigal son is the most in-depth of all of the stories. And so let's go through that. So uh, you have two sons. The younger of the two sons, uh, for whatever reason, wants his inheritance early. He wants his father to give him his, his share, his half of the inheritance, um, before his father actually dies, which is really weird. I think. I don't think that's something that regularly happens. At least I've never heard of that. Anyway, so his father um, obliges and gives him all of this money. Sells all of the, like half of the land and all, half of the cattle and all that stuff to give his son half of his stuff. And so the son runs off to uh, the big city and the, uh, the, the way that they describe how he spends his money is with riotous living. Okay. So Which he I, was having fun. He was having a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> the the implication is that he's sleeping around with prostitutes, which cost money, um, and he's drinking lots of wine and gambling. Those are traditionally the, the things that people attribute to his sort of wayfaring. Mm -hmm. um, and if you if you ever watch like some of the other uh, video adaptations of the story, like the the Mormon Church had one in the nineties. I actually kind of liked I that, one. that one. You remember that one? Kind of. Yeah, it's uh, like, like I liked the focus of that one because it wasn't just about the guy hitting rock bottom and then coming back, which is a, a great part of the story. Mm -hmm. But it focused a lot about the second brother, which we'll get to later. Mm -hmm. Um. So, so this younger son blows all of his money on booze and women and gambling, and he finds that when the famine hits. He has no money and no food. So he takes up a job working as a farmhand feeding pigs. Okay, And as he's feeding these pigs, he realizes how hungry he is and how he just wants to eat the slop that the pigs are eating because it's so much better. better than right, so they're, they're eating better than what he's eating. Yeah. And then, uh, then he comes to this you know, epiphany that the servants, the hired servants of his father eat better than he is eating now or mm -hmm. even you know even though he's you know working with pigs and all this stuff mm -hmm. it's like you know if he just got a job with his father again he would be better off than he is now mm -hmm. so he grovels to his father mm -hmm. says i've you know squandered all of my money and uh like please forgive me please give me a job and i'll work really hard and pay you back that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and so the the father is super happy that his son came back, mm -hmm. and he throws a party, he kills the fatted calf, because again, this is famine, so they have a special calf that they've been feeding extra, so that, you know, they can have, like, the, a big feast, mm -hmm. um, and, and while this is going on, the older brother sees, like, you know, the commotion, the celebration, doesn't know what's going on, so he comes to, he approaches the house, asks one of the servants what's going on, mm -hmm. and they inform him that the younger brother is back, and he gets all, you know, jealous and butthurt because he's getting this, you know, special party, this fatted calf um, for, you know, coming back after blowing all this money. Mm -hmm. um, and so the father comes out and greets him. Okay. And I actually liked the exchange that they had. So I, I just copied and pasted it uh, so that I could read it. So the, uh, the older son says lo these many years do i serve thee neither transgressed i at any time thy commandment and yet thou never gavest me a kid that i might make merry with my friends a kid meaning a calf but as soon as this thy son come which hath devoured thy living with harlots thou hast killed for him the fatted calf um, basically, he's just saying that it's not fair. Like, I've done all the right things, mm -hmm. and he's done all the wrong things, mm -hmm. and he comes back, and you give him all the stuff that you never gave me. 
mm-hmm. even though I've been the good one. Um, and his father replies, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. So the, so the whole point of this, remember, um, you know, this started with Jesus being confronted by Pharisees, accusing him of, you know, associating with degenerates and with prostitutes and um, with sinners. Mm-hmm. And, and this response is meant to be as, as a, like a, a chastisement for people that are self-righteous and holier than thou, that look down on people who make different life choices, who have, you know, uh, periods where they're kind of down on their luck, mm-hmm. you know, which is, which is an attitude that a lot of people have, um, not necessarily exclusively to religious people, but it is something that is common in some religious groups because they have this idea, you know, the, the, I don't want to call it karma, but it's like you get what you deserve if you do the right things, if you go to the right school, if you pay your tithing, mm-hmm. you will get certain things reciprocated back from mm-hmm. God, mm-hmm. right? So if you if you have good things, if you have possessions, um, that means that you're doing something right in God's eyes. That's, that's kind of the way that they portray it a lot of times. And that's kind of the prosperity gospel. That's a principle that Mormons use for tithing. Mm-hmm. And this is a common thing in... Uh, ancient Judaism, apparently, so I've heard, (laughs) that the Pharisees very much had the same kind of thinking, that, you know, if you do the right things, then you'll become, you know, wealthy, you'll have everything that you need in life and all that kind of stuff, so the people that don't have things, uh, or who have extra hard lives, um, did something wrong in their life, or maybe their parents did something wrong. That's a, something that comes up in other parables as well, like the the blind man that Jesus healed. Um, like the Pharisees came up to him and said, uh, "What was it, Lord, Lord? Like who transgressed? Was it him or his parents? Mm-hmm. Like that whole thing." Right. So this is like a theme that that happens a lot, and the idea that that we aren't better because we have more possessions or because we you know, had a better lot in life or we made better choices Mm -hmm. that on some level we are all the same. I actually like that. I think that that's a positive message. And I think that that's, uh, you know, that's the takeaway of this story. Like if you were to take, um, you know, the moral of the story, Mm -hmm. it's that we are equal and it's that just because you have uh, more possessions or you're, you're better off in your material things, that doesn't necessarily make you better as a person. Mm -hmm. I think that's a valuable lesson, which is something that I can't say I find in very many scripture stories, honestly. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, I was thinking about that today. It's like, there are so many stories in like the Book of Mormon, which right. I've been rereading. There are so many stories in there that I just think, I can't believe I ever found any value in this. Like the things that they're calling good or reasonable, like I just don't see it anymore, mm-hmm. you know? I don't know, have you ever had an experience like that? Like, have you re-looked at any stories or, you know, anything along those lines? Um, I mean, I know I've experienced that. I don't know. I can't think of specifics. I haven't, like, reread the Book of Mormon at all, but just in, like, discussions that we've had together or, like, rereading conference talks, like, I'll quite often think, I can't believe, like, I bought into this or, you know, I tried to believe this. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Nothing specific is coming to mind, but yeah, I have experienced that before. Yeah, no, I, I do remember you mentioned it, mentioning that with General Conference, mm-hmm. which we did an episode on. Yeah, that's a um, big one. Where, like, I, I remember you mentioning that in a lot of ways you lost respect for a lot of the leaders mm-hmm. because of their condescending tone. Right. And you had never noticed the way that they talked down to people. Yeah, that's true. Um, so, I don't know. It seems mm-hmm. like it's along the same lines. Yeah. You know, but when I was reading this story today... Like, I, I read it, and I was like, wow, there, that's actually a legitimately positive message, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Like, we are equal. Like, just because you have stuff doesn't make you a better person, necessarily. Um, and, it, you know, it, it also get, it provides a good example of kind of taking care of people that are downtrodden and in less fortunate circumstances, mm-hmm. you know, doing humanitarian aid, that kind of stuff. You know, those are valuable principles um, for society, I think. Anyway, so, so that's kind of my take on the story, the classic story. Mm-hmm. Um, again, that's in Luke 15. Um, so the, the movie takes the main part of that, that story, um, 
you know, the, the idea that you have the son that goes away, wastes a bunch of money, and then comes back. Mm -hmm. Okay. It takes that aspect of the story. Um, but it completely ignores the second part of the story with the older brother. Mm -hmm. And that, like, the, the more I've been thinking about that today, it just really bugs me that they left that out. Because mm -hmm. that's like, to me, that's the most important part of the story. It's not about the son coming back. Mm -hmm. It's about the older son realizing that he is in the same position. Like, he's no better than the son who came back. Mm -hmm. You know? should probably go over what this movie was about. Yes, we are getting to that. Okay. <laughs> I'm um, confused. Okay. So yeah, I have a, a little outline of how I have this, and Corinne doesn't see it. Um, so anyway, so let's talk about the main character, Sean. Mm -hmm. um, what was your impression of Sean? <laughs> uh, he was not a leading man by any stretch of the imagination. From like a purely like film oriented kind of perspective yeah. he just wasn't a good leading character no. yeah he, he, he was uh he just didn't fit that kind of role like like with this character maybe it's just because I've, I've seen other productions of this um like the lds one um you know that he had this smooth talking lawyer type that mm -hmm. could talk his way out of you know any any mm -hmm. situation, and he just he lives the fast life. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not exactly like Wall Street, you know, the movie Wall Street. Right. But you know, it's along those same lines. Like he has some success, mm -hmm. he gets some money, and so he starts blowing it on you know prostitutes and booze, and he starts getting involved in harder drugs, and mm -hmm. then he loses all of it, and he's in the gutter for a really long time, and then he you know crawls back to uh, I think he goes to rehab first, and then he. He comes back after going to rehab and recommits to Mormonism and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then the dad throws a big Christmas party, and then the older brother gets all butt hurt. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, where were they going with this? <laughs> <laughs> that was the LDS version, just to be clear. <laughs> right. So that was the LDS version, and then uh, so so with uh, this one, you didn't have that kind of charismatic leading role. Mm -hmm. It was just he this tried. kid. He tried really hard. Right. But it fell flat. It was not convincing at all. Right. Yeah, he just, he just wasn't that kind of uh, personality. Mm -mm. Um, and so it, it kind of showed in a lot of the interactions that he had with the other characters, mm -hmm. one of which his, his friend Cameron was also supposed to be that kind of charismatic person, mm -hmm. who I think did a little bit better of a job. Slightly better. He was, he was a, just slightly less it, And that was mostly because he was a genuinely funny person, at least in some of the scenes. Mm -hmm. um, like when they, they say, let's go get ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just kind of a random little thing. Like when, and, and that was the other thing about this. Like you could tell that this was made by uh, a company that didn't really know what going off the deep end looked like. Right. It felt like a student film. That's true. A well-made student film. That's a the student film that with I got a budget. Yeah, with a budget. Yeah, and so like. So you can just imagine like the dialogue and the content of it. Right. Just they wanted to it as a student film. They wanted to imply that they were doing bad things without actually showing you the bad exactly. things. Like they wouldn't even swear. I in know. The show. <laughs> <laughs> like one of their favorite phrases was "What the H?" <laughs> what the H? Because they couldn't say hell. Yeah. Because or saying H, hell. Yeah. Or H yeah. That that one. I I honestly didn't understand yeah i had to explain that to him at first yeah like h what, what i mean they they, mean wouldn't, by that? they kept saying oh my gosh too like they wouldn't even say oh my god yeah it was just it's just really funny and you, you yeah. know like in all of their beer bottles they've got like apple juice or cream soda like it yeah. just it was really funny yeah <laughs> <laughs> so so they tried really hard to make it look like they were doing bad things mm -hmm. uh without actually doing anything close to bad things right um, and so in, in that way, it was kind of funny Yeah. because it's kind of quirky. And then there's one point where they try and vandalize and their version of vandalism is really ridiculous. Too. Yeah. He <laughs> just throws a bottle on campus and yeah. it smashes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, okay. So Sean, the leading character, he's a college sophomore. Uh, he's kind of, you know, arrogant. He comes from a, a family where the father is a pastor Who's very? He's Kevin Sorbo. Kevin Sorbo, yes. Who didn't have nearly as much screen time as I was hoping. No. To be honest, it was a little disappointing. Yeah, didn't get enough Kevin Sorbo in this one. 
Way too much Sean. Yeah, way too much Sean, not enough Kevin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, it's, it's playing into that whole idea that uh, is common in, in Mormonism, and uh, apparently this is a, a theme that, that crops up in more mainstream Christian productions and just culturally, the, the, the idea that children of pastors or bishops or priests um, inherently rebel. inherently rebellious. They're inherently rebellious, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you either get the stalwart, um, you know, children that, that grow up following all the rules, mm -hmm. never rebel doing anything. Um, they, they, they always step in line. And then you, the, the contrast to that is that you get people that just go way off the deep end and just hit rock bottom, which mm -hmm. is kind of what they were trying to do with this character. Yeah. Anyway. So, so you were a bishop's kid. Oh, well, so were you. I know. But, but, but yes. I'm, did you ever experience something like that? Like, did people, like, treat you any differently or make, like, little comments to you about, oh, are you a bad kid or something like that? Um, no. I don't think anybody in my family ever fit the stereotype of a bishop's kid. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, looking back at it, I can only think of one person who legitimately rebelled well in their teenage years. Um, who was, he, and he wasn't even like a bishop's kid. He was, uh, a, his father was in the stake presidency, which is above bishops mm -hmm. for people that aren't familiar with Mormon hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So you have bishops that are over local congregations and then you have stakes that are over um, several congregations, usually like four or five congregations. Mm -hmm. And so his dad was in the presidency that oversaw a stake. And and he, in a lot of ways, went off the deep end. Um, and uh, my older brother, Jason, was uh, good friends with him. Okay. And and I think they, they still are in contact. Uh, but they had a falling out, like him and his parents had a falling out uh, that, that I had never heard of before. Hmm. Um, the kind of falling out that you usually hear of people, you know, like, like, like I, re I remember when I was uh, a kid hearing stories, you know, the horror stories of somebody wanting to join the Mormon church, mm -hmm. but their evangelical family won't let them and like is super repressive and all that kind of stuff. And so like they either disown them or force them to wait until this or this happens so mm -hmm. that they can get baptized and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, it was that kind of thing, but in reverse. So he just didn't... I, I don't think he believed in religion, and he realized that early on. And so he started to, like, get into kind of punk cu punk culture. He had a big mohawk, like a big, bright green, <laughs> <Right>. bright green <laughs> mohawk. He you was know, in Seattle in the yeah. 90s, grunge era, you know. And, you know, he never dressed up nice for a church, or at least he stopped after a while, mm -hmm. and then stopped coming to church altogether. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't remember very many of the specifics because he was older than I was, but I, I'm pretty sure at around 17 years old, he dropped out of high school and moved in with his girlfriend, mm -hmm. and then, uh, like, I never saw him again. Mm -hmm. um, no, I did see him once. I, I did an odd job for a guy in our ward who had a construction company or worked with a construction company mm -hmm. and this guy was there so i saw him for like the first time in like five years or something <laughs> mm -hmm. it was it was a little awkward <laughs> i didn't really know how to talk to him because i was still like in the good mormon mode right and and here he was and i edited her stories and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff um but he was you know he's a nice guy he's a super funny guy very clever mm -hmm. but uh yeah like super sad like the way that he was kind of pushed out mm -hmm. um like that's but that's the only person that i can even think of that would fit that kind of stereotype within mm -hmm. my circles. So I don't know. Do you, did you know anybody? Um, no one that like outright rebelled that was, that had parents in the bishopric. Um, I remember making fun of one of my friends. His dad was in the bishopric and then in the state presidency right after that, just because he was the good one. And you know, he yeah. wouldn't do certain things with us sometimes. But I, and I was lucky when my dad was bishop. I was, I started my first year of college that year, and so I didn't really have to deal with it. But mm -hmm. I do remember, like, offhand comments from people. You know, I, the, Mormons just really like the idea of a rebellious bishop's kid for some reason, in my experience. Right. Yeah, and they just like making comments. Like, you like make it's an some, inside joke kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, it's like or? an inside joke. Hmm. I, don't, I mean, it was never anything, like, bad. I was never, like, hurt or anything from it, but it was like, why, why is this a thing? 
Right. But I don't know. Okay. Anyway. So so they play off of that in this movie. Um, and that's kind of the reason that he decides um, not to go to the school that his parents want, which is a Christian school, mm-hmm. and instead goes to a secular college, like just a regular university. Mm-hmm. And he demands that his, his parents give him his tuition up front, right. which, again, who does that? <laughs> yeah. Um, and this guy is a pastor, and the implication is that he's going to pay for all of his son's schooling, all four years. Up front. Well, which is just weird. Well, he wants it all up front. That wasn't the original plan. Right. They, they they had some kind of deal where, like, he would get the first two years, I think, up front. And then if he got all straight A's, which is super hard at a regular college. Yeah, that's um, dumb. Um, then and he, he would get... And he let the money stretch for two years. Then he would get the rest. Right. And, and then he would get the rest for the next yeah. two years. Um, yeah. So, which is kind of funny because at, at the point where he gets like at rock bottom mm-hmm. like everything just crashes down all at the same time and all of a sudden in the space of he like an hour no <laughs> money yeah it was ridiculous <laughs> oh, so the timeline of this is a little weird too right you're never entirely sure how much time has actually elapsed i think we made it through like half a semester I th- yeah i don't know I, I at think... one point at one point she does say that she's been going to church for like two weeks uh-huh and that's like the only time reference you get is that at least two weeks has passed since he's like started dating this one girl. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think based on some of the comments made by his English teacher, they made it to about halfway through the semester. Yeah. But he only wrote like two chapters of his autobiography, though. Right. So let's get into that. So yeah. so he's we really in this. We need to talk about this, like, <laughs> how this movie goes. So okay. So he has a, an English professor. Um, who is super arrogant because that's the way professors are. Especially English professors. Yes, and well, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about more in uh, these, these Christian, these yeah. Christian uh, these scholars. Yeah, the, the, the Christian idea of what a, a professor is. They're always arrogant. They're always mm-hmm. uh, condescending. They never respect anybody Mm-mm. ever, and they always hate God. Except for this one. This one was into God. This one a was higher into God. power. A higher power. Least. Yes. Um, he made a few comments about moral absolutes and uh, higher power. He was kind of uh, advocating for that sort of thing when this kid like right. stood up in the you middle of class. You can't have your own moral center without having a higher power. That's more or less what he said. Right, which, which is which is Christian speak for um, more relativism, uh-huh. which they didn't ever explicitly get into and they and that's the thing they don't explicitly get into anything in this movie yeah it was very soft as far as the theology goes it was it was very weak like they had a couple of conversations between him and this girl that he wanted to date and it was all just soft it was all circular they just kept saying the same thing yeah so so he goes to this class and he gets this writing assignment um, about as an English major, I just want to say this English class probably would never exist. Yeah. <laughs> it's more of a writing class. Yeah, so what was the assignment? I'm trying to find it in Basically, my notes. Basically, the assignment was you're writing a semi-autobiographical like story about yourself. You're supposed to talk about um, individual stories, like how mm-hmm. life is a story. Yeah. He never like actually dictates what the si- assignment specifically is, but you can kind of figure it out. Yeah, it was really vague. Yeah, again... Everything about this movie it was, was really vague. pretty vague. And, and, and basically, as, as far as the story goes, it, it gave them license to kind of do little snippets of diary entry type stuff, mm-hmm. which was kind of the way that they narrated the movie. I did not hear diary. What, what did I say? <laughs> oh, you said diary, but it didn't sound like diary initially. <laughs> did you hear diarrhea? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this diarrhea. This diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> and then I heard the tree. <laughs> anyway so so that's kind of their their way of getting him um talking and explaining his story um yeah. and he like does a lot of voiceovers and it's him reading his chapters right um anyway so so he goes to tons of parties he's late to class a lot he's kind of like even though like it's implied that up until this point his sophomore year he has been getting straight A's because he he doesn't stress about any of his grades ever. 
Um, Except for this one. Except this for this one, one class. class. He has to pass this one class. Right. And it's the only class he goes to. Apparently. At least in the movie. In the movie, it's the only class he goes to. Yeah. Um, so, and yeah. He so he's repeatedly late. R- right. That he's repeatedly <laughs> late. Like, like, all of a sudden, like, he is partying too much. And he's struggling to keep up now for some reason. Even though it's implied that he's been doing this all along. Right. So, I, I don't know how they manage that. Plot holes. Plot holes, yes. Lots of plot holes. Um, Anyway, so um, I thought it was kind of funny. This is kind of a little thing that I I just wrote down as a side note. Do do you remember the scene where they're walking by the homeless man? Yeah. And uh, he gives the homeless man 40 40 bucks. 40 bucks. Which which is supposed to be... well. Yes, there's the the funny line. But it's supposed to be... um, uh, him being frivolous with, with his money. Like, he's just giving it out to people. Right. But it's a homeless man that legitimately needs money. Like, that right. was a good service act. Right. Yeah, Like, I like totally, what yeah. exactly... Like, it's like a double message that they're trying to give. Like, right. Like, was it a good thing or wasn't it a good thing? Right. Like, maybe he could have over-tipped his waitress. Right. Maybe that would be a little more... Or given it to the church. Maybe that's what they were trying to go. Um, but yeah, they, they did have a funny line. It was... Uh, so so he gives the the man forty bucks, and then his friend Cameron says, like, hey, he's he's just gonna give, he's just gonna spend all that money on booze, and and uh, Sean replies, well, that's what we were gonna do, uh-huh. <laughs> because they're on their way to get booze for a party that apparently is happening at his place. That right, night. and there were a few other funny lines that I wrote down as well. Oh really? Um, so when they they meet the guy that runs the Bible group, uh, James, I think was his mm-hmm. name. Uh, do you remember the the girl that walks by? <laughs> yeah. I can't remember what he said, but I remember so, it was stupid. So, so okay, so you have these these two guys, uh, Sean and Cameron, who, uh, you know, they're in their rebellious college years, right? And, and they're out partying all the time. And they meet a guy from their more religious days named James, who runs a Bible study group on their campus. And he's inviting them to go to the Bible study group. And as they're talking to him and they're trying to avoid committing to it, this girl in like a short skirt or short uh, shorts or something walks by them and both of them just like stare at her as she walks by. Mm-hmm. Okay, like total like lustful eyes mm-hmm. kind of thing. And and James was like, hey guys, guys, bounce the eyes, guys. <laughs> bounce the eyes. Bounce the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that a thing? I have never heard that before. <laughs> One of the problems, like, that scene that just made me laugh so much because of his delivery. It sounded like a high school theater production. Right. Where it was just overemphasized. It was, I don't know. It just Too much enunciation to be yeah. believable. Bounce the eyes, guys. And Bounce he has, like, this huge smile on his face the whole time he's saying it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and he's, like, gesturing wildly. I don't know. Just everything about this movie is awful. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um... Let's see, there were a couple other ones. We already talked about H, yeah, and what the H. Um, there was another one. I, oh, I can't remember what this is in reference to. I just wrote that on the line. Uh, guard your heart. Do you remember what that was in reference to? Was that when he uh, hooked up with that girl and somebody mentioned that to the girl? It was girl? James. Was it, it was James? James in the, in, the, in the car when he's dropping her off. Okay. Allie off to go get Sean from this party. Right, so we he haven't says, talked about Allie guard yet. your heart and I'll pray for you or something like that. Right, so we haven't really talked about Allie yet. So Allie starts off as, like, very trepidatious about Sean. She doesn't For like all him. of, like, ten minutes. Right. And, and she keeps blowing him off and he ends up kind of stalking her a little bit, trying to ask her out on a date. And then, uh, then she finally agrees to go on this date or something. And James... Was this... This wasn't their first date. This was like no. later on. This right? is later on in their relationship. Okay, this so this is, is after like they had like weeks the little mini falling out or something. No, they haven't had their falling out yet. This is what leads up to the falling out. Okay. She started going to this Bible study group right. and a church, which kind of irks Sean. Right. And James is the leader of the Bible study group. And, and he's like walking is, her home or something. Yeah. Right? yeah. And he, Sean, just got expelled and he just got kicked out of his apartment. Okay, right. And he's like. This is when he hits quote unquote rock bottom. Right. And so he's drunk and on drugs at this party and he calls Allie and says, mm-hmm. Hey, come over. And she's all worried about him and James drives her. Uh-huh. And then as she's getting out of the car, he says, Guard your heart. Guard your heart. I'll pray for you. <laughs> <laughs> Which I guess is like a nice gesture. Like, but like this be kid careful. is like 19, 20, 21 years yeah. old. 
Guard your heart. Guard your heart. And he's like super creepy. And it, it seems like James has the hots for Allie too. Yeah. A little bit. Like he kind James of James would have across. been more convincing, I think, in the role of Sean. You think? I think so. Yeah, he did kind of have that that look a little bit. But uh, anyway, Guard. it's just just some funny funny little one liners here and there. Guard your heart. Um, anything else to say about the English professor? No. He doesn't really have a major role. He doesn't have a major role. He, I don't know. Yeah, nothing about the English okay. professor. Um, we mentioned Cameron, who's basically just your nihilistic, uh, party-going, um, mm. you know, college kid that just likes to, you know, drink and hook up with girls. Right. Who apparently he's falls in love with a girl. But, <laughs> yeah, he's non-committal, but likes to be in a long-term relationship at the same time. Right. But honestly, just, like, he, even he, like, he, I think he was a better actor, technically. Uh-huh. But, like, his character just wasn't believable either. Just the way, he, I don't know, the way he was written. Like, uh-huh. he didn't come across as the partier either. He came across as a legit teenage boy who's experiencing the world for the first time and just right. happens to enjoy drinking a little too much. Right. You know, he's a little arrogant, but, like, what teenage boy isn't at that point? You know? Like, yeah. nothing about these guys screams rock bottom, rock bottom yeah. at any point. They just seem like regular guys. Yeah, they're just regular guys. Yeah. Like, I, I, that actually kind of bothered me a little bit, too. Especially, yeah. again, I keep going back to the, the LDS one, mm-hmm. um, where he legitimately hits rock bottom. Like, he's yeah. an addict. Like, and he's he legitimately all his making money. bad decisions. Yeah. These, like, guys are, these guys are doing drugs recreationally every once in a while. They drink right. maybe a little too much, but and they're, they're still to going to class. And he's still getting mostly A's <laughs> yeah. in his class. <laughs> like, these aren't bad kids. <laughs> it's like, by most standards, they're doing pretty okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so these are the kids, or, or these are the characters that this this Christian group is deciding are prodigal <laughs> or deserving of that title. Um, anyway, so let's see. So Sean gets expelled from school, which I think we mentioned. Yeah, um, I dropped the ball on that one. And he. <laughs> He gets expelled for probably the most ridiculous reason. So dumb. I've no ever one would of. get expelled just for doing this once. Right. So there was a a, a, a video mm-hmm. where he, um, at the the encouragement of Cameron, mm-hmm. um, yells something to his teacher. At, like they're, they're just walking around campus, right. like after hours, like it's dark mm-hmm. and. He just yells something to his English teacher right. well, and then so throws the, a bottle. Yeah, the big thing the big thing about Sean, like, that they keep stressing, this was the thing they kept stressing, was that he didn't want people to tell him how to live his life. That's why he left home, because right. he felt like he had too many rules, his parents were putting too much pressure on him. Mm-hmm. And he felt the same way about his English professor, that he was telling him that there's only one way to live your life and mm-hmm. you're not doing it right. And that's why he was upset. Right. And so, yeah, the encouragement of Cameron and their little friend Jenny or whatever. uh uh-huh said oh just tell him how you feel and it's like the middle of the night on campus so the professor's nowhere in sight right it's dark outside they've been drinking and they throw two bottles well and only yeah. one of them's on the video. only one of them's on the video and he he throws like a girl yeah well that, that's Sorry the other the thing. stereotype that's i know i've been trying he's, to avoid that but. he's he's a little effeminate and and, and it wouldn't even bother me if it weren't for the fact that this is a Christian movie. Yeah. And it's that, a Christian movie, and technically he's supposed to be a bit of a playboy. Right. And he is not convincing at all. And and and, it, and the thing that, that bothered me about it is that this kid in real life probably is gay. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know him personally. But, but he comes across as gay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which means that he is one of those self-loathing gay Christian kids, which just makes me feel bad for him yeah. you know again Which, we don't know any of this we don't sure. know any of this for sure this is just kind of the way that he's he comes across on screen he yeah. has a seriously lot of within the first very two effeminate man- mannerisms yeah. and the way he talks a Speech little bit patterns yeah <laughs> and the way he throws a bottle <laughs> and rocks yeah like that's a thing that he does throughout the movie like he, oh they always have shots of him throwing something yeah like it's supposed to be something that people usually do just to fill the time oh Right. On so many levels. Oh, yeah, when helpful. they were just sitting uh, like, like uh, on the side of that road. Yeah, and then whatever. he has a couple of shots, I think, by himself where he's just sitting and he throws stuff, too. Yeah. So so he gets expelled because this video goes viral on social media. Like, weeks later. Weeks later. 
It's not even the next day or two days later. Right. And so he gets so he gets called into the dean's office, and the dean says... By a slip is... of paper from his English teacher. Right. <laughs> he, gets, he gets called into the dean's office, and the dean is like, this is behavior unbecoming of our university, uh-huh. and it's mixed with vandalism. You are hereby expelled immediately. And you're fined $5,000. Right. And, and then, uh, then he goes to his apartment... He's and, freaking out a little bit. Right. And understandably so. Like, right. you get expelled for something that stupid, I would right. be freaking out too. Yeah. Um, and then he gets a call from his landlord who says, by the way, your, your, uh, your rent bounced, your rent check bounced. Yeah, this month's rent bounced. Oh, and the month before bounced. So two months, Where, apparently yeah. his checks have bounced. And this is the first he's heard of it. Right. And then he says, don't even bother paying me. Just get out. Just get, get out. out. Which, really? I'm, yeah, I'm pretty without sure... Without prior notice, I don't think you're allowed to do that. Right. Well, I mean, most places, even student housing, if you miss rent by, like, what is it, a week, um, they'll start putting notices on your door, yeah. and then, you know, another week, then they'll kick you out. Like, that kind of thing. Yeah. Like, it's usually something along those right. lines. Right, you have to have a notice, though. You can't right. just be kicked out suddenly. The same day. Yeah. <laughs> like, that doesn't even happen. No. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, so, so this is all happening at the same time. Then he goes to this party. And he just gets wasted. He's trying to forget the day, uh, which, again, is something that a lot of people do, a lot of college kids do. Right. Like, they have a bad day. They want to forget it. Mm-hmm. Um, His friend even says that. He's like, lots of people just do that, you know? Life right. sucks sometimes, and you just have to self-medicate. Right. Exactly. So so he goes to this party. He gets wasted, and he calls up Allie, the girl. Mm-hmm. And she comes kind of in duress. She thinks that he's, like, completely... Just unraveling. Mm-hmm. She doesn't know what to expect. She's and concerned. She's concerned. And, and she was she, in the middle of Bible group, by the way. Right. <laughs> Which was just ending, so it was mm-hmm. fine. Yeah. And James was okay with it. And James decided to drive her. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> was that when he says, guard your heart? Yeah. Okay. Okay. We've Got technically it. Already, been over, already been over this portion. Okay. Yes. And so, so he freaks out and starts acting like... Her helping him is her controlling him, mm-hmm. just like this is Sean, not James. Right, exactly. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, it's it's all about you know everything is all about well, his dad. In this point, he thinks that she's judging him because he's wasted. Okay. It's not necessarily she, he thinks she's controlling him. It's you know you think, I think I'm a bad person. I think he did make some comment about her trying to control him or something like that. Maybe, but, but I think it's mostly she, he thinks that she's being judgmental. Okay. Which would make sense, because right. she probably was a little bit, but... She didn't really come across that way, though. She legitimately came across as, are you okay? Like, she was concerned yeah, about Yeah, I him. guess that's true. Like, as far not as... at any point did she say, this is unacceptable behavior. It was, are mm-hmm. you okay? Do you want to leave with me? Can we go somewhere? <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. She was she was a very mild-mannered person. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. Um, anyway, so, so she leaves the party, and... In a huff, in because a huff. he made an awful daddy reference right and and then he like kind of runs after her and cameron tries <laughs> tries to stop her and cameron like stop like, him fake hits him sorry yeah so they cameron just like kind of shove each up. other back yeah, and forth kind of of <laughs> <laughs> anyway so sean gets out of the apartment and runs after her in he his almost, car he almost gets hit first I like running down the street by james was it's it james? car <laughs> oh right yeah. yeah okay so so james like speeds off he almost hits sean then Sean gets into his own car and, like, drives off trying to catch her. He's in- inebriated. He, yeah, he's completely just hammered and uh, hits a tree. <laughs> okay, so... You don't actually see him hit the tree, but you're told later that he hits a tree. Right, it's implied. Well, I guess Cameron outright By, says uh, it. By tricky camera movements. Did you notice that? I, I think I was actually looking down when it happened. Oh That's how gosh. brief it was. It was bad. <laughs> yeah, it was really brief, but, you know, they try and do that camera twirls or whatever like, oh, indicating was that, that the, yeah <laughs> it was bad <laughs> anyway so he wakes up um, it's like the next morning he's on a couch and he hears Cameron talking in the kitchen to this girl that he's apparently started dating he's been dating her throughout the entire thing she's the girl at the very beginning all right yeah anyway so so Cameron explains the situation because like of course Sean being um, blackout drunk and in a wreck mm-hmm. uh, couldn't remember anything right. because you know that's what alcohol does <laughs> um, and he explains the situation and, and Sean's like 
you know, at first he, he has that little outburst where he, like, punches the fridge and whatever. <laughs> Which is funny, too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then... It's uh, seriously out of nowhere. Yeah. And then... Uh, you fucked my car? He's like, oh, man, f- can, I, can I get a ride somewhere? Yeah, and then he's completely okay. Uh, can you take me somewhere? Just got that out of the system. Yeah. And he's like, can I go somewhere? Uh-huh. So Cameron gives him a ride to talk to Allie to try to patch things up. And, uh, of Doesn't course, Allie, Allie won't talk to him. Mm-hmm. Just super cliche. He tries teen for all drama. of like one minute to talk to her. Yeah, it's lame. Anyway, so that all happens. That's all part of his hitting rock bottom. Mm-hmm. Um, I think at one point he actually got a job as a janitor, right? Yep. Cleaning toilets or something. Yeah, because he doesn't want to go back home. He needs money. Right, so that's He's the, the equivalent Cameron. of him feeding the pigs. Right. So that's fun. <laughs> hey, it's. it's I guess about it's equal, kind of, in yeah. today's society. Um, let's see. Look Sorry at if notes. anyone's a janitor out there. I don't mean that in a bad way. Right, but in the, in this movie, they're equating that with him hitting rock bottom, right. having to get a janitorial job. But that's like that's a pretty common college job, actually. Yeah, like it totally honestly. is. And I do not understand. Like his parents must have been paying a ton of money for him to not have had a job for almost two years. Yeah. Oh yeah. At a and regular the way, college. Yeah, and the way he was like spending money. Like, there are, there's, like, at least two or three scenes where he goes up to an ATM and withdraws at least $100 each yeah. time. Yeah. And he hasn't had to have a job yet. Exactly. Like, he's... he's and his friend hasn't tons either. Of I don't know why his friend lives by himself either. Like, nothing about this story is believable. Exactly. In the slightest. Right. So, Except so basically... Maybe the rebellious kid. Yeah. So, basically, this movie's version of Rock Bottom is for Sean to have an unrealistic bad day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so he, he has this bad day, a lot of stuff happens to him, mm-hmm. and he decides that he's going to swallow his pride, mm-hmm. and he's going to return home, mm-hmm. and and he decides to go back on a day when, um, when Kevin Sorbo, his dad, his preacher dad, is giving a sermon. Um, so it's Sunday. So it's Sunday. Uh, and <laughs> yes, not just and, a day, <laughs> not just a day, and and Kevin Sorbo. This is Kevin Sorbo's big moment in the movie. This is where he gets to actually talk because mm-hmm. he didn't really say anything up until this point. Yeah, not really. I don't really. think so. Like, there's a couple. There's like an snippets. argument that they kind of have. Yeah, it's it's really like faded. Like you can catch like little phrases here and there. Yeah. Um, so this is like his big moment in the movie, right? Mm-hmm. And and the whole point of the so so first he like throws out. Um, the prepared speech that he had made mm-hmm. and he decides he's going to go off the cuff and talk about his his feelings about his son that won't talk to him he hasn't seen him in two years mm-hmm. and all that stuff which of course makes it super poignant when um when sean finally arrives right and, but it's not in the middle of the sermon i was expecting that right well that's true that would have been more poignant it would have <laughs> been like oh okay that yeah there it is <laughs> so it happened after the service and everybody's leaving mm-hmm. right um but the, the point of the sermon, well, first was, you know, he misses his son. Mm-hmm. Um, and it seems like he kind of is reconsidering being such a hardline pastor or whatever and not having quite so many rules that he pushes away his son. He kept, he kept saying, like, he just wants his son to come home. Mm-hmm. Um, he can't love him enough. Right. And then that, then that sends him off on this crazy, like... Um, you know, like tangent about mm-hmm. how God's love is infinite and incomprehensible, mm-hmm. um, which is fun because in that we have the line that says, uh, "It's so grand, it's so infinite, it's so big that it it won't fit inside my head." Mm-hmm. Like I need, I would need a bigger head mm-hmm. just to understand it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which was super funny coming from Kevin Sorbo. Oh, <laughs> Who seems to have a head that is plenty large. <laughs> um, That's what happens when you're Hercules. Yes, exactly. I mean, he's a demigod. Yes. Right? He's a demigod, not a god? It's like half god. He was like Zeus like well. had a had like an affair with a human yeah. or something along those lines. He was like half god. I don't know Greek mythology very well. I don't either, but... That's I, Greek, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which one is Athens? <laughs> anyway, so... So, uh, so yeah, so that's the whole point of the sermon. And then they have this big 
moment where they all have this big group hug where they see Sean walking up to a, the church or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this, of course, sets Sean on the path to make an amends to, you know, right. w yeah, which is just kind of silly because he it's doesn't... It's all fit into, like, the last ten minutes of the movie, if even ten yeah. minutes. Probably not even ten minutes. Probably not even ten minutes. Like, you don't even see him make amends. He goes mm -hmm. up and he hugs his parents and suddenly everything's A-OK. -okay. Right. And then... Voila, he's back in wherever he's going to college. Right. And finds Allie at her Bible study. Right. Barges in. Barges in. In Super the middle rude. of Bible study and just, you know, <laughs> makes everyone hold on so he can talk to Allie. Right. What, what you, in front you of said is, is just super selfish. Yeah, it is super selfish. That, that was what I was thinking the entire time he was talking. Yeah. Because he was trying to convey himself as being a different person. Like, I am because a better person now. I've gone home. Mm -hmm. Like... I understand now what you're trying to tell me about my dad. I won't be so It's like, no, you are exactly the same. You are selfish. <laughs> you are you just, barging in on something that she cares about that you still haven't even, like, apologized for, like, right. denigrating. And, and he never, I don't think he ever even talks about Jesus or God or church or anything like that at the end anyways, right? No, not at the end. Like, the, the implication the impli is that Yeah, the implication that is that there. through that right. hug, he suddenly believes everything again. Right. Which well, actually, kind of I think it's that he always believed. He just yeah, suddenly Yeah, that's the, the common view, that there's no yeah. real atheists. There's no real atheists. There's just people in denial. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but, they, but they never come out and say it. Again, no. everything is Everything is, is implied. They try yeah. and imply it, but their implications are very vague and... Right. It's, yeah, it's not... And, and I love the part at the very end... Uh, where he he he's kind of wrapping up his thoughts about the whole experience, and he's he's you know coming to the end of his story, so to so to speak, and he's actually still working on this assignment. Yes, <laughs> throughout this entire thing, he's Even been he's expelled, expelled from the school, but he's yes. still writing this assignment. Why? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Like, if it was just, even if it was just him, like, doing the voiceover, it would be fine. But they literally show him on his typing. computer typing it out. Yes. So he is still writing his semi-autobiographical assignment right. that he can never turn in. Because he's because been Because he's expelled. been expelled. Unless there's some implication, again, everything's implied, nothing's explicitly stated in this movie, where he somehow made it back into the school... I don't know. And has the exact same teacher and the exact same assignment and, and the exact and no same semester. no repercussions at all. Right. But, I mean, I didn't get that from the movie at all. No, so it, no he never goes back to class, although he yeah. does have a much nicer apartment, if yeah. you notice. <laughs> right. Not so his so parents bland. obviously are still paying for things. Yeah. It's like that, again, that's so unrealistic. Yeah. It's just, oh. Yeah. <laughs> this awesome. movie really irritated me. Yeah. So, super irritating. Yeah. Just ridiculous the crap out of me in this whole movie. so so i mentioned that well first of all like, like the main aspect of this story for me has always been about the older brother mm -hmm. and his jealousy and not being so self-righteous mm -hmm. and that of course was like what spurred jesus to even talk about this this parable in the first place mm -hmm. um you know the pharisees and all that um and they completely leave that out one of the other things that well, there, there were a few other notes that I made that kind of stood out mm -hmm. to me uh, that we can talk about a little bit. One, uh, this kind of touches on something that it's kind of a phenomenon that's going on in America right now where college students in general are leaving religion at a faster rate than ever before. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of plays in with that with not just with Sean, but with Cameron and all the, you know, the party goers and yeah, all that kind of stuff. I don't think Cameron was actually religious. You don't think so? Mm -mm. That's not what I got from it at no. all. I, I'm James only addressed Sean. He never addressed oh. Cameron. He didn't know Cameron at all. And you Cameron think maybe made Cameron's a like of... a new acquaintance? No, I think... So, <laughs> I think Cameron and Sean were friends before. Uh -huh. They left together. But Cameron was never religious. Just from some of the comments that he made about his like the way he grew up. Like mm. His parents never gave him rules or anything. They just gave him money so he would leave them alone or whatever. Right. Like, I don't think he was ever religious. He was the friend. He was the bad influence friend. He was the gotcha. negative example so that Sean followed. So don't be friends with nihilistic atheists. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, I, I just thought it was kind of interesting. There's kind of an undertone that's, that isn't really explicitly addressed anywhere. Because, again, nothing is in this movie right. explicitly addressed. No. We already talked about Not Bishop's kids. The what? The God issue. Like, 
They is there a God? Tried kind yeah, of. Yeah, that's true. Him and Allie have a couple of discussions, and it's basically she she just, likes going to church. Yeah, she, she likes, likes going community. to church because of the father figure. Yeah. Allie's backstory is that her dad left when she was three years old, and she's always felt like this hole inside. You know, she doesn't mm-hmm. know if it was something she did. She had right. a friend that had a really nice dad that gave her this awesome cross necklace that she really wanted. Right. So that she just, she has daddy issues. And so suddenly she's told, oh, well, come to church and you'll discover God and he'll be <laughs> your father. And that's why, that's literally why she goes because suddenly yeah. she feels accepted by this invisible being in the sky that is yeah. suddenly her dad, who up until that point never cared about her either. So it seems like um, Sean and Allie were made for each other in the sense that they both have lots of daddy issues yeah <laughs> um but the the other thing so so i talked about this is probably the last thing that i want to talk about um you know i, I talked about how overall this this story actually uh i find a lot of good things about mm-hmm. like the actual story in, in luke um more so than a lot of things that i find in scripture in general um overall i like the message um the problem, though, that I have with this, with this, is that it gives, especially with, you know, movies like this that depict it in this way, where the prodigal son comes back to the fold. Mm-hmm. You remember, um, it was a year ago we went on vacation with my family up to Bear Lake, mm-hmm. and my mom was super happy about. Oh, Philip. Philip. Yes. My uncle Philip. I almost brought this up when we were talking to Megan. All right. Mhm. Uh, yeah. And uh and my my uncle Philip, he's he's the baby of the family, well, uh, of the original kids. My mom has a mixed marriage family, so like That's his hilarious. herds and ours and all that kind of stuff. So she he, so Philip is like the youngest of her actual siblings mm-hmm. except for the half sibling that they have together. Sorry, super confusing. <laughs> anyway, so she looks at Philip as like the baby brother. Mm-hmm. Um, and he fell away from the church pretty early on in his adult life mm-hmm. and went off and did certain things and blah, blah, blah. I don't even know that much about his history, honestly, because my mom didn't like talking about it. Mm-hmm. And I hardly ever saw him at family reunions because he, I think he was a truck driver for a long time. I think he still is. Mm-hmm. Um, and he recently, within the last couple of years, started getting back into Mormon church activities, and he... Uh, he was listening to things like podcasts and stuff on his drive. Your mom oh, that specifically what it was? Said so- yeah. Oh. She, she was, he was, like, reacquainting himself with gospel things when he was driving. Ah. Uh, okay, so, so, yeah, so he reconnects with Mormonism. He's in his 50s, I think. Mm-hmm, um, and he reconnects also with... Uh, high school acquaintance Mm -hmm. um, who he ended up marrying last summer on the day of our wedding on the day of our wedding yes that was fun which was a little bit upsetting (laughs) at first (laughs) but it also got a lot of our family my my family to come to our wedding who might not well it was just weird because we didn't know he was getting married until like everyone was in town like oh yeah philip's getting married the day you guys are so we'll come to yours after what (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, don't worry. We'll come to yours after. Like, yeah. uh... <laughs> but but he got married in the temple, which yep. is a huge deal. Just so, down the street from where we got married. Right. So not in the temple. So the year before that, mm-hmm. so uh, so this summer they got married. The year before that, we had the vacation at Bear Lake. My mom was super happy that he was getting back into the church, mm-hmm. and we had this conversation where she brought it up in front of uh, mm-hmm. me, Megan. So both me and Megan have. You know, at, by this point, left. like gone away, our separate mm-hmm. ways from the church, and my brother Parker was there, who has been in and out of activity, um, and then I can't remember who else was in the room. You were I there. I think it was just us. And then I, I get the feeling, I, I remember there being somebody else in the room. It might have just been it was, Parker's wife. Yeah, it was Parker's wife. Um, and she so, was playing with her daughter, so she wasn't even paying attention. Right. So, so basically, the three, I guess prodigals of our family what, black she's sheep. hoping to be prodigals exactly that's which what, what i'm getting to at, talk about too. Which, is, which is what i'm getting at mm-hmm. it, it and so that's exactly it like it's it's bringing people like my mother this false hope that someday megan and myself will come back to mormonism mm-hmm. and then our, we'll have our eternal family again mm-hmm. and that I think is the harm of this because mm-hmm. it's it's taking away what was this you know the story where um, this guy 
it falls into these uh, lifestyle snares, right? He has addictions. He becomes of the world. Becomes of the world. But it, like, you know, traditionally when, when they tell a story, like he's an addict, he's mm-hmm. he's homeless, like right. he really is legitimately he's really made bad, bad decisions. Yeah, exactly. And they're equating that, my mom equates that mm-hmm. part of the story mm-hmm. with me leaving the church. Right. That bothers the crap yeah. out of me. No, I know. That's exactly <laughs> what my parents think too. Yeah. And, and it's, and I, that... That to me, I don't know. Like that's, uh, it's hard to accept. It's mm-hmm. hard to like deal with that. Mm-hmm. It's hard, and and I didn't even like when my mom brought up Philip like at that that gathering. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't say anything. Like I didn't know what to say. None of you guys did. <laughs> None of us did. It was super awkward. It's yeah. like how do you even say, Mom, I'm not coming back. I know. Like, like, I'm just not. Like, mm-hmm. I don't believe it. Yeah. I have no reason to believe it. Mm-hmm. I have lots of reasons not to believe it. Mm-hmm. I'm not coming back. Right. And to her, that is, like, the worst thing. It's worse than me being addicted mm-hmm. to something mm-hmm. or whoring out or whatever, you know. Oh. <laughs> I'm trying to picture you whoring out. Yes. <laughs> it's difficult. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Like, like, how do you even have that conversation with somebody who buys so deeply into the idea of an eternal family? Mm. You know? Yeah. I actually have never enjoyed the story of the prodigal son, and it's for right. that reason. Yeah, even, like, when I was little, I didn't enjoy the prodigal son story. Mm. Mostly, though, because I identified with the first son. Like, I... Uh. um, I don't know. I think... I know one of your things with this movie was that they don't have the other son... And yeah. that really bothered you about this movie. But the portrayal, the portrayal of this, like, I think the takeaway from this story, at least in mainstream religion today, is the prodigal son. The second son doesn't mm-hmm. mean anything. It's just like a background character. I think that's why they didn't have the second character in this, because yeah, the prodigal son sense. is the main... It's what people focus on. It's their right. hope. Like you said, it's their false hope. It's mm-hmm. for all of the people out there that have straying family members. It's like they can come back. And it, the right. implication is that they will because these right. people have hit rock bottom and they think that we're hitting rock bottom too and that someday we'll see the light. And I've always had a problem with that. And yeah. I always identified more with the first kid because he did do everything that he was supposed to. He stayed on. He didn't ask for the money. He worked. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, like it would be a huge slap in the face for a younger sibling to come back and... Right. Suddenly be given everything again. Especially this guy. He gets his tuition again. He gets a nicer apartment. Right. This girl still hooks up with him. Like, that's not <laughs> real life. It's not. Like, yeah. I I don't know. Like, even if I came back to the church, like, I don't... My parents wouldn't throw a party like that. And you they know? should. <laughs> I just... Uh, it's just not realistic. And I always feel bad for the older son. Always. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. And that's why I don't like this story. Yeah. Never have. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any uh, final thoughts? No. So I think we covered it. So would who would you recommend this movie to? No one. I either. Well, hold on. Oh. <laughs> either your best friend or your worst enemy. I don't have a worst enemy, and you're my best friend. So <laughs> that one. <laughs> so you're saying that my question is stupid it's obsolete it doesn't it's not (laughs) applicable (laughs) all right well that is our show Mm -hmm. mm-hmm i don't know what i'm supposed to say thanks Thanks for for listening listening. there we go (laughs) it's one line and i can't ever remember you had one job (laughs) one job to do um as always you can rate us and leave a review um if you'd like to get in contact with us you can do so by emailing us at skeptic squared podcast at gmail.com and you can check out the show's website at www.skepticsquaredpodcast.blogspot.com. And we will see you next time on the Skeptic Square Podcast. Bye bye now. <laughs> 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 <laughs>